Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Peter Gannon, and I'm the president and CEO of United Way of the Greater Capital Region. We have an exciting program today with uh, a featured speaker who is no stranger to many of you participating in today's call. Um, in the title of the program is The Roots of Racism. It's being brought to us by uh, Barbara Smith. And uh, those of us here, especially in the capital region, know Barbara. But before I introduce Barbara, it's important for me to first acknowledge the somber anniversary of today's date, one year anniversary of the murder of George Floyd in Minnesota, and uh, reflect on one year of uh, the, the hard work a lot of us have done, um, but also acknowledging the fact that it's been decades and decades of labor in this movement to try and advance towards a more equitable, more just society. Um, United Way is proud to play a part in that here in the capital region, but we certainly don't do it alone. And today's programming, which started uh, in the wake of <clears throat> the murder of Floyd last summer with uh, six organizations who came together to see how we could advance and build upon some of the uh, impressive activism we saw uh, being led by uh, many mostly young and uh, mostly people of color right here in our community. Um, we sought a way that we could sustain this conversation. And we came together uh, as United Way, the YMCA, the YWCA, the Community Foundation, and In Our Own Voices. And that group quickly grew to over 40 different organizations from different sectors to work toward sustaining that conversation. And what we initially thought was we would execute a 21 day equity challenge to help people along their path and their development to being more equitable and more just. And as that challenge concluded, the group unanimously made the determination that we needed to continue to convene, to continue to work on these issues, hold one another accountable, um, work on organizational requirements that would actually advance the ball towards greater equity, greater justice. That conversations led to the formation of this group, which has continued to work earnestly to develop some of those membership requirements. Uh, they've made increased accessibility to expertise in these areas to help uh, build the uh, capacity of the organizations involved and <clears throat> leads us to this conversation today. And it, it's, a, it's a huge uh, privilege and honor for me to have a chance to introduce somebody who uh, I admire and, and many of you do as well. I know Barbara Smith from her time uh, as a member of the Albany Common Council, but uh, her work spans many more decades than that as an author and activist and scholar who's played a groundbreaking role in opening up a national cultural and political dialogue about the intersections of race, class, sexuality, and gender. She was among the first to define an African-American women's literary tradition and to build Black women's studies and Black feminism in the United States. And no secret to many of us, she's been politically active in many movements for social justice since the 1960s. All of you have had uh, a list of uh, some of Barbara's most recent writings uh, since uh, the start of the pandemic shared with you in preparation for today's conversation, but there's, there's much more. And I would encourage everybody to follow uh, Barbara on Twitter uh, or uh, seek out her website, which is easily found with a Google search where you can uh, learn about uh, some of the uh, other edited major collections she's participated in, including All the Women Are White, All the Blacks Are Men, But Some of Us Are Brave, Black Women's Studies. And her most recent work, Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Around, 40 Years of Movement Building with Barbara Smith, which uh, was released back in 2014. She is the co-founder and publisher of Kitchen Table, Women of Color Oppressed, which is significant, and she'll speak more to this today, um, as the first uh, US publisher for women of color to reach a wide national audience. I previously mentioned her um, honorable service on the, as a member of the Albany Common Council, and she worked with the city of Albany after her time on the council to develop the city and develop and implement the city's first equity agenda. Also nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2005. So. Uh, it is my pleasure, and we are grateful for you today to spend some of your time with us uh, to here to present the roots of racism, Barbara Smith. Thanks, Barbara. Thank you so much, Peter. And I want to thank United Way for giving me this opportunity to communicate with members of our community. Before I say anything else, I just want to acknowledge that we here in the Capital Region are located on Mohawk. Mohican land, the land of 
the indigenous people who were the original inhabitants of this nation and of this region, and also the land of the nations of the Iroquois Confederacy, where certain people who founded a place that became the United States drew their ideas about what that democracy would look like because the Iroquois Confederacy was indeed a democratic form of governance for those nations. I'm so happy to be able, as I said, to speak about and speak to members of it with members of the community about the crucial issues on this very somber day. I wanna start by sharing something that I wrote about the personal impact of racial terrorism. For nights after learning what had happened, it was difficult for me to sleep. Every time I awoke, I thought about him and felt the horror once again. Day or night, I was near tears whenever I focused upon how he had been brutalized and what his family was going through. The despair and fury I felt were nothing new. Since childhood, I have been forced to live this nightmare again and again. In 1955, although I was too little to know what it meant, I learned 14-year-old Emmett Till's name when he was lynched in Mississippi for supposedly whistling at a white woman. In 1957, when I was 10, I watched nine black students attempt to enter Little Rock High School while a mob of screaming white adults attacked them verbally and physically. In 1963, four black girls near my own age, Addie Mae Collins, Denise McNair, Carol Robertson, and Cynthia Wesley were murdered when the 16th Street Baptist Church was bombed in Birmingham, Alabama. More than any of the others, their deaths taught me the measure of my life and the great white scheme of things. Somebody's daughter, somebody's neighbor girl, somebody's child, someone with carefully braided hair and a crisply, and a crisply ironed blouse, someone whose people saw to it that she got to church every Sunday, someone like me, was in the end worth nothing, was a creature to be hunted down, obliterated, and killed. On none of these occasions, nor in response to the countless other atrocities which occurred when the Black Freedom Movement was at its height, did the white media run stories about how to comfort children as they do now following tra uh, tragic events, since the only children suffering from the aftermath of these acts of terrorism were Black ones. During the 1980s, New York State, where I have lived since 1981, spawned some of the nation's most notorious acts of racial violence. And think about that. One of the most liberal states in the nation, uh, a reliably blue state as far as uh, partisan politics are concerned, had a spate of racial violence incidents. These include the mob attack on three black men at Howard Beach, in which one of them, Michael Griffith, died. Bernard Getz's shooting of four black youths on the subway, the murders of Eleanor Bumpers, Michael Stewart, and Yusef Hawkins, and the series of racially motivated murders of six black men in Buffalo. Shortly before I moved to Albany in 1984, an unarmed black man, Jesse Davis, was murdered by the police in his apartment a few blocks from where I now live. The so-called weapons the police claimed they saw in his hand turned out to be a key case and a toy truck. In August 1997, Two white men in Virginia burned alive a black man, Garnett Paul Johnson, and then beheaded him. 
1995, the Oklahoma City bombing was orchestrated by sociopaths who were not merely anti-government, but white supremacists, a fact ignored by most of the white media. One supporter of the bombing commented on the internet, it's a real injustice that white children had to be injured and killed in this attack on the Zogs, Zionist occupation government's Oklahoma headquarters. When I confront the ongoing reality of racist hatred, it affects me not only politically, but personally. These acts serve as unequivocal reminders of how thoroughly I am hated here because I was born black instead of white. As long as I am alive in the United States of America, I cannot assume that a similar act of terrorism will not happen to me. I imagine that you may be thinking now that I wrote this in the aftermath of George Floyd's lynching one year ago today. But I actually wrote what I just shared in 1997 in the aftermath of Haitian immigrant Abner Louima being beaten, sadistically tortured, and nearly killed by New York City police because he tried to break up a fight at a nightclub. I'm gonna hold up the book that I read from. This is one of my books, The Truth That Never Hurts, Writings on Race, Gender, and Freedom. It was published in 1998 by Rutgers University Press. And I carefully took out the details of dates because I just wanted to make the point that the beat goes on, this continues, the carnage continues. So I can read to you from something that was written in 1997 and it could have been written yesterday, tragically and appallingly. I am wondering how many of the incidents of racial violence that I recounted to you just now are familiar to you. None of them, including the murder of Emmett Till, are ancient history. But under white supremacy, we experience racial terrorism quite differently depending upon our vantage point. Long before George Floyd was lynched a year ago today, Black and other communities of color have endured for centuries the burden of pandemic hate violence that the power structure simultaneously sanctions, orchestrates, and ignores. I am guessing that a number of you are involved in social services. Such a large part of our social service infrastructure actually deals with the destructive social, economic, and psychological consequences of how white supremacy plays itself out in the lives of individuals and families of color. Because of easily accessible cameras, first video cameras, as in the beating of Rodney King in 1991, and then camera phones, it is more difficult, though not impossible, for mainstream society to deny that these events are actually occurring. How these atrocities are adjudicated by the criminal justice system is another matter. Derek Chauvin being found guilty of murder a few weeks ago is a vast exception to how police brutality and extrajudicial murders are and are not punished. There has been no justice for Tamir Rice, Philando Castile, Sandra Bland, Brianna Taylor, and countless others. I wanted to talk with you about the roots of racism because I think there is just so much confusion about race and racism in the United States. Rest assured that that confusion is quite intentional. The power structure does not want the majority of people in this country, especially those who benefit from white skin privilege and racial division to have a remotely accurate grasp of history or an analysis of how white supremacy functions to this day. The recent attacks by state legislatures across the country on the teaching of critical race theory and the New York Times 1619 project, which were also attacked by the previous presidential administration, illustrate how invested those who hold power are in maintaining the racial status quo which is so much easier to do 
when all that is offered to us are myths, half-truths, and silence about what is actually going on here. I heard someone recently, an historian, a black historian, I believe, uh, talk about how the way that the United States um, views history and teaches history is uh, like it's a resume. History as resume, because you only put the best stuff on your resume. You leave everything else out and hope that nobody else finds out about it. Uh, of course, with social media now, <laughs> it's pretty hard to hide anything. But I just thought that was such a great concept. History as resume, United States history as resume, only the high points, all, only the things that make people look good. Founding fathers, almost all of whom were uh, slaveholders. Oh, but we don't need to mention that. Um, so many ways of glossing over and covering things up. I want to discuss three major questions this afternoon. And they are, how did things get this way? What purposes or what purpose does systemic racism, white supremacy serve? And most importantly, what can we do about it? Now, before I go any further, um, Peter said that I have a unique perspective on these matters. Um, the uniqueness, I think, is because um, I'll just say it right out to you. I'm a part of the left in this country, the left wing. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm definitely left of the Biden administration. <laughs> and maybe that will help place me. But the reason I mentioned that is because if people really understood what it means to be a part of the left, it means that we try to go to the root of why things are happening, what they mean, and, and what we can do about them. And I don't really believe in going along to get along. Really never have, at least from the point that I became politically active and politically conscious way back in the 1960s as a teenager. So if this sounds different from what other people are saying, including people who are very famous and who have best-selling books, uh, I would attribute that uh, what I just told you, that's one reason why. And then there's another reason too. I'm a black feminist. So I have a perspective that is intersectional and um, more complex than just looking at one system of oppression uh, singularly by itself. So how did things get this way? Now I'm not pretending to tell you everything that happened. There's no way I possibly could, nor could anyone in the amount of time that we have allotted. But I do wanna talk about some major historical breakpoints that will help us to understand why we have the kind of nation that we have and the kind of racial quagmire that we have. How did the racial situation that we find ourselves in begin? Why in 2021, 402 years after the first Africans were brought here for the purpose of enslavement, are we still grappling with racist violence and vast inequality based upon race? Here's a snapshot of some of the history that those conservative legislators do not want anyone to know. First of all, genocide. I mentioned the uh, indigenous nations that were here long before any white European settlers. And the way that this nation came about was uh, two historically horrific series of crimes. The first was genocide, genocide of the indigenous people. This country is built on stolen land from the indigenous people who had lived here for thousands of years, at least maybe tens of thousands of years, probably tens of thousands of years. The US is a settler colony. And that means that the values of the United States are very much embroiled and entrenched with what happens when you have a settler uh, colony. Unlike other nations that were uh, organized long before the modern era, this nation, which is really quite young, in the history of the world was uh, founded upon people coming from one place, claiming it, and then doing lots and lots and lots of very, very upsetting things, and that's to put it mildly, in order to maintain their hold upon a nation that they claimed. 
it's a settler colony. Those who came here from Europe, when they arrived, were confronted with a vast undeveloped continent. How could they possibly extract the value, the wealth from the land and develop an agricultural economy? So there were, these were some of the solutions. And this is the major, the major uh, atrocity, the second major atrocity that we always have to think about when we think about why are things the way they are in the United States. Um, stolen labor and unspeakable crimes against humanity because of chattel slavery. Indentured servitude was not ideal because indentured servants had a set term of labor and then they were free. White indentured servants could also run away and disappear into the white population. Enslaving Africans and exploiting their labor and making enslavement a permanent status was diabolically efficient. And that is something to know about US chattel slavery, which is considered by scholars and historians to be the worst system of enslavement that has ever existed in human history. There are people who, uh, some of them in con Congress and elsewhere, they like to talk about, well, every uh, culture, every country had uh, uh, people who were enslaved. Yes, that may very well have been true, but in uh, so those other nations, the status of being enslaved was not immutable. In other words, there was a way of getting out of it. Enslavement often was a result in those uh, other countries of warfare. So people who were conquered were enslaved, unlike in the United States. I mean, it was a purely financial economic transaction of stealing people, kidnapping people, bringing them here to work for free forever. And um, as I said, in those other systems, it was not immutable. You could get out of it sometimes even by marrying into the family of those who enslaved you. Whereas in the United States, if you were born enslaved, you would die enslaved and all of your offspring, even if they were the product of rape of your white master. And of course that was a wholesale part of the slave industry, the forced rape and breeding of black women by white male owners. No child born to an enslaved black woman uh, an enslaved African woman was to be free unless there was a dispensation. And if you look at the histories of Thomas Jefferson and George Washington, you'll see how that played out. Uh, the ideology of white supremacy resulted, and I talk a lot about white supremacy. After George Floyd was uh, lynched, I started writing an article. I'm going to read you a paragraph or so from it a little bit uh, later in a few minutes, but uh, I wrote an article about white supremacy because I didn't know what else to do as a writer with all the pain. I mean, I guess I've been writing <laughs> for that purpose as witnessed by what I read to you at the beginning of uh, my presentation. I guess I've been doing that for quite a while, figuring out how to deal with political realities that are terrible realities, writing about it, writing it out, and in some cases actually changing uh, those realities. So as I said, uh, white uh, supremacy has been something that has concerned me over time. And during the last uh, year, I've actually written not one, but four articles about white supremacy, three of which are op-heads, are war op-heads in the Boston Globe. And one of them was an article in The Nation magazine. So I've been kind of delving into it. And my purpose, I might add, was not to give people a scholarly uh, view of white supremacy. I was writing on purpose for a popular audience. I wanted people who read newspapers or magazines, the general public, I wanted to provide some stuff for them. And that's... Uh, but what, what, what I was uh, trying to accomplish with those articles. So as I said, I've been thinking a lot about the ideology of white supremacy, the ideology of white supremacy, which resulted 
from the exploitative system of enslavement, not the other way around. Slave owners needed to develop an ideology that would justify actions that under any other circumstances would be sanctioned and condemned. It needed justifications for criminal acts that were not viewed as criminal uh, because the, these are actual criminal acts that were not viewed as criminal because the victims were not white. For example, kneeling on a man's neck while he pleaded for his life and bystanders were also pleading while knowing that you were being filmed. That kind of criminal act. Well, as I said, miraculously, um, that particular criminal act of murdering George Floyd did result in punishment. That is not the usual uh, situation. I wanna go back to the statement that I made about the ideology of white supremacy resulting from the exploitative system of enslavement and not being the cause. People often think that the reason we have these horrible race relations and particularly those first, um, you know, those first terrible um, incidents of its uh, founding is because, oh, white people were just so racist. You know, they were just so racist and they decided to enslave Africans. People have different perspectives about this. And I'll mention one of those perspectives in, perspectives in a moment. But my feeling is that the ideology of white supremacy was put in place to justify a, an economic system because enslavement is primarily an economic system. So that white supremacy as an ideology, ideology was put in place to justify what was already uh, underway. Um, I recently have um, watched a wonderful video by the incredible historian, the black radical historian, Robin D.G. Kelly. And uh, his presentation is about racial uh, capitalism. And he says that in reality, in Europe before this country was founded, that uh, racializing and racialization was happening on the European continent. In other words, the people who held most power, like Anglo-Saxons, Teutonics, whoever they were, um, racialized the Irish, the Italians, Jews, um, who to our minds, and, and in fact, were all of European heritage and what, and what we would now call white. So uh, Robin, uh, Professor Robin, Dr. Professor Robin D.G. Kelly was making the point that the habit of racialization and making people into outgroups so that you could exploit them summarily had started even before the founding of the United States. But I think that the uh, intricacies of the ideology of white supremacy, that is an, an, American, an, uh, an American production. And as I said, I believe it was created to uh, justify what was going on in real time with the economic exploitation of chattel slavery, not the other way around. Um, as we know, and uh, slavery uh, occur, uh, took place and was in place for several hundred years. And then there was a civil war, the bloodiest war in US history, where people from the same country fought each other to the death. Hundreds of thousands of, uh, hundreds of, thousands of people died. And then there was a period of reconstruction from 1865 to 1877. And that was a time when uh, rights that uh, people of African heritage living in the United States, rights were granted to our people that had never been granted to them before. Uh, black men went to Congress, only black men got the franchise, um, not, not black women because no women had the franchise at that time. But in any event, there were people who went to Congress, there were uh, people elected to state legislatures. And of course, as has been pointed out uh, recently, um, the, uh, although the Confederacy lost and the South lost, they never conceded <laughs> that they, you know, that they, they're still fighting that war and they continue to fight that war. And they, of course, wanted to do everything possible to get things back to their liking. And that was done with the collusion of the federal government. Um, so 
um, during the during that period, then our when when uh, Reconstruction was demolished, uh, there was a period, of course, of res of resistance, domestic terrorism carried out by the Ku Klux Klan, and it was followed by uh, the restoration or redemption. Uh, the period following Reconstruction, which was a horrific period for uh, for Black people. Uh, the period following Reconstruction is referred to in Black history as the nadir. And the nadir, as you know, is the lowest point. So following Reconstruction, radical Reconstruction, as it was called, uh, following Reconstruction, uh, what we went into was the nadir, and then, of course, uh, soon the establishment of Jim Crow. So to get to the next question, what purpose does systemic racism, white supremacy serve? I want to read to you a section of the problem is white supremacy, uh, of the article that I wrote, the op-ed that I wrote, the problem is white supremacy, which as I mentioned, I began writing a few days, a year ago, after George Floyd was murdered. And in that, I wrote the following. Because the power structure has always refused to acknowledge the institution of white supremacy, many people do not believe it exists. And most people are confused about what the term even means. Toxic as such beliefs are, white supremacy is not merely the individual delusion of being superior to black and other people of color. Institutionalized white supremacy does not need individual bigotry in order to function because it is a universal operating system that relies on entrenched patterns and practices to consistently disadvantage people of color and privileges and privileged whites. And I'm going to read that over again because that may be a perspective that you have not necessarily been aware of or are familiar with before. Institutionalized white supremacy does not need individual bigotry in order to function because it is a universal operating system that relies on entrenched patterns and practices to consistently disadvantage people of color and privileged whites. People so often think that it's like, it's what's in our hearts. And if we would just love each other and love one another, blah, 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 blah. I'm not saying I don't like people to be kind to each other. I'm not saying that I want people to be vicious. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm trying to explain is that there is a system here that operates above our heads and beyond our control often because that's how the sausage is made and that's how the system continues to function. The term, quote, systemic racism, end quote, clearly conveys the pervasiveness of racial oppression, but white supremacy goes further by indicating that there is a rigid nexus of power that protects and enforces it. I want you to think, you can think right now, but also after uh, today's uh, meeting, uh, today's uh, presentation, I want you to think about what you see happening that reflects the white supremacy that I'm talking about that doesn't really have a rely on individual actors in order for it to go forward. That would be something to think about. Perfect example is what we have seen during the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. The fact that there are such disparate, disparate um, outcomes and have been, been such disparate outcomes uh, for people of color in comparison to white people as, as far as how the disease has devastated our communities. Nobody made a decision about that. That was already running. Health disparities in the United States was already in place. And the health disparities are not because people of color are so ignorant that we don't know what to eat, how to live, and what to do. It's because we don't have the resources in our impoverished communities that would allow us to 
take best care of ourselves. I am speaking to you from a food desert. I'm in Arbor Hill. It's a food desert. Fortunately, because I have a car, I am not uh, compromised by the fact that it's a food desert. One of the things I did when I was on the Common Council was to meet with people on more than one occasion. That is, I mean, during more than one period. You know, like we would meet for a while and then we would, you know, like we'd get so far and then it would stop. And then maybe a year or two later, we would meet again about can we get a supermarket with fresh uh, food into Arbor Hill? That's systemic. You know, nobody made a decision. That is, nobody who lives in Arbor Hill made a decision like, we don't want to have a supermarket. Of course, people would love to have a supermarket. But the, uh, when we, what, the roadblock we would hit when we would be working with su supermarket, supermarket chains is that you don't have the income level, you don't have the number of uh, shoppers that would make it worthwhile, a worthwhile investment for us to open a supermarket in your area. So here we are this many uh, years uh, later. Systemic racism and white supremacy, not just individual bad actors. Now, to go back to that history that I was beginning to outline, which plays such a role in all that we're discussing, uh, after uh, Reconstruction ended, and then the period of redemption or restoration, Jim Crow laws began and practices began to be codified and they uh, end to law and segregation was therefore codified and black second class citizenship in every aspect of life was defined. De denying the vote was the highest priority of Jim Crow besides cutting off economic opportunity. Denying the vote uh, was the highest priority because it denied Black political power. And what are these people doing today? Hundreds and hundreds of laws have been passed since January of this year. Hundreds of laws have been, uh, if not passed, I'm sorry, introduced in state legislatures all over this country to, um, to uh, monitor the vote and to deal with uh, uh, illegal voting and um, and elections that are not uh, elections that are not fair and accurate. That voter suppression is part and parcel of what I just mentioned in relationship to the Jim Crow laws that um, that made it imp virtually impossible for black people to uh, vote before the civil rights movement of the 1960s. And guess what? Uh, by the time the 60s ended. I was in my 20s. So it's not that long ago. <laughs> so for the first 20 years or so of my life, the majority of Black people in this country weren't, at least in the majority of states, were not allowed to vote. If, uh, if you lived in the North, if you lived in the West, you could vote. I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, so people in my family could vote. But like if you lived in the old Confederacy, um, you were basically not voting and people gave their lives, sacrificed their lives in order for black people to vote. That was a large focus of the civil rights movement. As it was during slavery, black people's status was enforced by, um, during Jim Crow by state sanctioned violence. Between the end of the Civil War and 1950, more than 4, 1,400 men, women, and children were lynched. I'll repeat that. Between the end of the Civil War in 1865 and 1950, more than 4,400 men, women, and children were lynched. That statistic comes from the Equal Justice Institute, Brian Stevens, uh, and the incredible, incredible work that they've done to document the history of lynching in the United States, including uh, building a monument that chronicles and documents all the lynchings in all the counties all over the country. Not all the lynchings occurred in the South, although most did. There are quite a few in Ohio, Indiana, Midwest, uh, and uh, border states. 
How does institutional white supremacy work? Uh, the GI Bill after World War II is a very good example. There were a limited number of seats and historically, and just to say the GI Bill uh, gave benefits around education that is going to college and also around uh, uh, obtaining and purchasing a home. There were a limited number of seats in historically black colleges, while historically white colleges and universities would not admit black students unless they were uh, Northern state universities. Some of those universities did indeed admit black students. They just did not provide any place for them to live. So you could apply to Ohio State, for example, you could be admitted to Ohio State, but they were not gonna provide any uh, housing for you. Um, always barriers. But in any event, uh, even so even though black uh, soldiers theoretically had the same benefits as white ones, they could not access them. In fact, because there were not enough places in black institutions or in state institutions that um, black GIs could exercise the educational benefits of the GI Bill. That's systemic. You know, like no one person made a decision about that. It was built in. So it looked like, you know, well, the GI Bill is for everyone, except, except for reality. A similar dynamic occurred with segregating, segregated housing. Redlining and other discriminatory banking practices prevented Black veterans from using the GI Bill to secure mortgages because banks restricted where Black people were allowed to purchase property and live. Again, so a limited uh, pool of where you were allowed to live. I experienced that in my own family in Cleveland in the 1950s. My family was able to purchase a two family house in the early 1950s. Uh, my uncle who already owned a house in a, in a predominantly black area wanted to move to another neighborhood. And the bank refused to write him a loan that he was fully qualified to take on because he was black. And that was the first time I saw a black man cry, or a man, because I didn't know any white men, of course, at that time. <laughs> but that was the first time that I saw a man cry in my presence. And that was when my uncle came to visit my aunt, his sister, to talk about how he had been refused for this loan. So that was systemic. Um, the next question, the last question, which is the most complicated question, is what can we do about it? And if I knew the full answer to that, well, I don't know if I'd have a million dollars or not, because in reality, the system doesn't want us to do anything about it because the system is just fine chucking along as it is. They will do the cosmetic stuff, but as far as get, digging down and changing things, root and branch, not so much, not so much. Um, when most people think about race, they think about it in some terms that I'm gonna share with you. And I'll say why those terms don't necessarily cover the whole picture. And I've already talked about systemic white supremacy and the ideology of white supremacy. So you'll probably uh, be able to figure out why using the, this kind of a template, these kinds of templates that I'm gonna share with you wouldn't necessarily address the entire situation. When most people in the United States, States think about uh, race and problems with uh, problems of racism, what they're really thinking about is race relations, which is how do people of different groups get along or not get along with each other? Now, it's not that that is not important, but when you have banks not writing loans to people, when you have uh, business owners during a pandemic who cannot access uh, the, uh, can't remember the abbreviation, the benefits that people got who were economically affected by the pandemic because they did not necessarily have those good relationships with banks previously and the paperwork and the lawyers and whatever else was needed, that's systemic. Um, so how people feel about each other, how much uh, you uh, love, uh, LeBron or, 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 or uh, Obama, or the Obamas as a family, or you know Beyonce or whatever, you know, 
at the end of the day, it's just not going to change things because the problems exist on a level of power. And the problems actually are when life chances, the opportunities and life outcomes of people are determined based upon race. And that's not really about race relations per se. We would like to live in a beautiful community, a beloved community, as Martin Luther King of the Civil Rights Movement described it. But he also was very strong talking about uh, economic exploitation. The March on Washington in 1963 was a march on Washington for jobs and freedom. Jobs and freedom. People forget that. Uh, people also talk about prejudice or bias. And those are your individual attitudes about how you feel, again, about groups of people. And again, it's not that we want people to be prejudiced or biased, but that's not the sole um, issue. It's not necessarily dealing with what is going on systemically. Uh, discrimination. Now, that's another way of understanding and thinking about the problem. That gets a little more to policy because if, for example, as was recently reported on television, if the assessed value of your house goes up like $150,000 when people think the house is occupied by a white person, then that's discrimination, that's systemic, that is something that needs to be addressed. I don't know if you heard about that story, but you know, I saw uh, the woman who just happened to crying about the fact that she said, my, my house is considered to be worth less, worth less because I live in it, because I live here. There's hate violence and hate violence is not the sole definition of uh, how white supremacy and systemic racism function. Uh, people often think hate violence is heinous. Uh, we want it to end. But again, it won't necessarily take care of the entire picture. After the uh, insurrection at the Capitol on January the 6th, there's been a much larger public focus on white supremacist hate groups. And that's all well and good, but it doesn't really look at, well, where did this white supremacy come from to begin with? Why do they embrace it? Why do they love it so much? Why do they think this way? Where else is it in our society? Um, the, uh, the example I just gave you of your home being uh, valued and assessed at a higher amount, if, if it's thought that you are white or if the owner is actually white, identical houses, but one's white and one's black and you get you know, less of, uh, you know, your, your house is considered to be a less valuable because you're a black person living uh, in it. Um, that's, you know, um, you know, that's the kind of uh, situation that we are trying uh, to address that getting rid of the hate groups, the organized hate groups is not going to address. Get how, how is getting rid of those hate groups going to change that pattern in practice of how of a real estate assessment? It won't. Why is it important to talk about white supremacy instead of prejudice, implicit bias, discrimination, microaggressions, inequality, et cetera? Because none of these terms are causal. These are all symptoms and are the result of white supremacy. They are not causes. They do not refer um, to the cause of North uh, America's ongoing race war. Systemic racism is an, is an accurate description, but it does not necessarily point to a nexus of power. White supremacy, on the other hand, is a system. I'm going to read to you now. Um, there's so much that we can do about it because we can organize on a policy level. Uh, we can organize uh, in protest. Uh, we can speak out in various ways about what is not working in the United States. In the past year, a lot of focus has been on the police and reforming the police, including the call to defund the police or even to abolish the police. And as a result of that, there are some municipalities that are already instituting having 
different kinds of interventions when crises occur. Like, for example, not sending armed officers when there's a, there is a mental health crisis. So all that organizing, that 50 state and global response to what happened a year ago today has made some differences in how work and systems go forward. But it's a big, 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 big uh, system and we have much more to do. Um, I'm gonna to read to you from an article written by a friend of mine, as it happens, um, that is titled, uh, uh, it's about being an ally or not being an ally. And uh, its title is Nine Reasons Why Acting in Solidarity for Racial Justice is Preferable to Allyship. And it's by Jamie Grant. And let me just repeat the title. Nine Reasons Why Acting in Solidarity for Racial Justice is Preferable to Allyship. And solidarity means shoulder to shoulder. Um, allyship might be a step or two removed. It's not that it's wrong to be an ally, but there are other things that you might also uh, be, including a co-conspirator uh, uh, or an accomplice. So uh, allies often focus on the interpersonal. Solidarity actions work to dismantle structures. And I'm not reading you all nine, I'm just reading you, you a selection. Allyship is heavy on talk. Solidarity is action. Allyship is a gift, in quotes. Solidarity is a responsibility. Jamie writes, I watch a lot of allies waiting around for their gold star, their moment in the sun for having done something above and beyond the call of duty. A lot of these activists complain that people of color aren't immediately excited or warm to them in activist spaces. People working in solidarity understand that we carry the history of white supremacy in our bodies, in our faces. There's no reason on earth to trust white peers in racial justice work. I would add to trust white peers automatically. There are no, because that, that trust can develop and happen. There are no cookies for showing up. We may not get invited to the celebration party afterwards where our peers of color might need a people of color only space to download and support each other. Reward is the opportunity to do something meaningful to counter a violent order that was built to serve our interests. And I don't know if I should mention that Jamie Grant who wrote this is a white person. Uh, this is uh, the last one. Ally work generally does not redistribute resources. Solidarity means that we intentionally work to redistribute the ill-gotten gains of racism. Jobs, schools, neighborhoods, housing, healthcare, and capital. So I'm going to conclude by telling you about a book that you may wish to find. I always have lots of books <laughs> to recommend. And it's surprising that I'm only recommending one of them. <laughs> well, wait, this, this is not over yet, is it? Um, there's a book that is titled Slaves and the Family. It's by Edward Ball. And it came out in the 1990s, as I recollect. And uh, one day I heard Edward Ball being interviewed by Terry Gross on the NPR show, Fresh Air, her incomparable show, Fresh Air, one of the best interviewers who's ever lived. And as I said, Edward Ball was talking about his book and, and the book uh, is, he, he is the, uh, the descendant of one of the largest slave holding families in the United States, mega rich. And they, uh, owned hundreds of human beings. And he began exploring his family history. And in doing that, he knew, of course, what his origins were. But in doing that, he found out that there were lots of people who he had never met, who he was blood relatives with, who had been enslaved 
on his family's land. So he went about finding those people and having conversations with them. Um, and it's just a, it's a remarkable uh, book. But what he said in this interview is something that I've never forgotten because Terry Gross asked him, did he feel responsible for what his family had done? And this is what he said. He said, I am not responsible for what my ancestors did, but I can be accountable. And I think that's the best that any of us can be. And that is a thought that I want to leave you with. You're not responsible for all that bad history that I just told you about. And I'm not responsible for it either. We weren't there. We did not create it. And had we been there, who knows what we would have done. Now, if it had been me, if I'd been there at the time, I wouldn't have been doing much of anything unless I got involved in a slave rebellion, because of course I would have been an enslaved person. But in any event, um, there's no need to be guilty about what we cannot change in the past. There's just no reason. Um, but we can uh, figure out how to be accountable about what that past has left us with and what we still see that needs to be done. So having said that, I am going to uh, stop for the moment and I look forward to your comments and to your questions. Barbara, thank you so much uh, for that. You, you said uh, when we talked, uh, I can do about 25 minutes and I knew uh, once, you, once you hit your groove, <laughs> we would be pushing up against the time. But uh, I think I speak for the hundreds of attendees, we could go much longer on this uh, if, if, not for, uh, if not for it being the end of the day here. There were a couple questions that popped up in the Q&A and we'll get to those in a second. I'm, just, I'm vamping to just give you a chance to catch your breath because you gave us a lot there and, and I appreciate it so much. And I know uh, based on some of the parallel conversations in the chat, others do too. Um, let me get this out of the way. Uh, one of the uh, participants in the chat uh, had suggested to follow you on Twitter, and that's at the Barbara Smith or at uh, Smith Caring Cirque. Those are two things on Twitter. I, I follow the one, I follow the personal account on there, and it's uh, as this uh, participant said, nonstop continuing ed. So um, it's, it's good stuff uh, and I appreciate it. So uh, a couple of uh, chats, uh, a couple of questions in the chat here. And uh, let me start with uh, one that comes from our friends at Albany Fund for Education, which uh, references your discussion of the food deserts and how it applies to the intersection of capitalism and white supremacy, right? The, you, know, you need, need a profit in order to operate a supermarket in a neighborhood and, uh, you know, the black and brown customers aren't going to make enough to make it worthwhile. Um, how is it possible? Uh, and you yourself admitted part of the political left, um, but is it is it possible to dismantle with white supremacy independently, uh, independent of dismantling capitalism? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, what a question! <laughs> so there's a term I haven't used yet this afternoon, and that term is racial capitalism. Right? Except I think when I talked about uh, Robin D.G. Kelly. But um, racial capitalism is totally implicated in everything that I have discussed with you today because uh, the system of the economic system that we have in the United States, which is indeed capitalism, is built upon racial uh, divides and racial exploitation. We see that from the history and it still is the case. Look at essential workers during the pandemic and what has happened to them. Look at the fact that we can't get a $15 minimum wage, let alone a living wage, which would be higher than that. And the system of uh, capitalism disproportionately disadvantages people of color. More poverty, uh, shorter lifespans, uh, less success, less educational success, uh, less pay, you know, you know, there's st studies, research that shows that you can get a college degree or even a, a graduate degree. And if you're a black person, a, a high school, a white high school graduate earns more than you, or at least equal. You have degrees and the white person 
uh, went to high school and they earn the same as you or more. So it's, um, it's really a trick bag. And that's why we need to have a just society overall. Because if we had a just society overall, uh, decisions would be made about all human beings need to have ac access to decent food. So let's uh, maybe that margin, you know, out in, you know, Del Mar or in Niskayuna, you know, maybe that margin of profit, maybe some of that could actually go to support a supermarket for people who were not as fortunate. But I know how I'm sounding, so I'm going to stop. Uh, I think you're, you're definitely amongst friends here, so uh, don't, wor don't worry about it. Um, there's just one other question here, uh, a ton of gratitude and, and a, a grateful, grateful uh, group here for your labor and energy in putting together this presentation today and decades of work on these issues. But uh, somebody going by Jennifer asks, do you have any advice or recommendations for people not previously involved in activism to, become, to begin to become involved? Thank you, and uh, again, more thank you so much for your presentation. So do you have any advice for po folks who want to get involved or is your answer run far away? <laughs> oh, I, I would never say that. I, I would never say that. We know you would. Yeah, I, I, I love being an activist and an organizer, clearly, because I've been doing it since I was a teenager in the 1960s. I never really stopped except like when I was doing important things like going to graduate school. But in college, you know, the entire time I was in college, you know, I was very active and I volunteered with the Congress of Racial Equality Corps in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, the focus of the civil rights movement in Cleveland during that period when I was in high school was on school desegregation. And guess what? I was a student in that system, that public school system, who mir miraculously was going to an integrated school because of neighborhood residential uh, patterns. Be that as it may, um, I would suggest that you keep your eyes, if you're interested in getting involved, uh, that you keep your eyes open to see what groups are doing. You know, look around, you know, I mean, we have so much access to so many things because of the internet and social media. Look around and see what's happening in your community or pick an issue, <clears throat> excuse me, or uh, pick an issue that speaks to you, really speaks to you, and see if you can find people who are concerned about the same thing. One of the things that I say about um, activism and organizing is if it's making you unhappy, if it's making you feel miserable, if you feel disrespected, isolated, unseen, whatever it is, then you need to move on. You need to find another place to do that work because there always is another place to do that work. Another piece of advice is you can't solve at everything. You know, I've not done very much hands-on work at all, working on the environment and global warming and the climate crisis. I personally have not done that. I did like four, was it four or three? It was three uh, workshops last summer for Extinction Rebellion, our local Extinction Rebellion, about understanding white supremacy. So I guess I made a little contribution there. But as far as being in a group that meets on a regular basis to plan strategy around that issue, I have never done that. And yet I actually do know that there is a climate crisis. And I know that there are climate refugees. And I know that the Amazon is a uh, rainforest is burning. I know those things. And I know that the wildfires that we have that start so early in the year on the West Coast that all of that has to do uh, with a crisis that if we don't solve it, every jig will be up. The whole thing will be up because we won't be able to organize around say mass incarceration and police brutality if we don't have any water to drink or air to breathe. So it's just having that kind of consciousness, but choose the things that speak to you. I'm a literary person. So, um, and that's my profession. Uh, teaching uh, English, uh, African-American literature and, Af and Black women's studies on the college level. And so a lot of the work I have done um, has that kind of literary, those literary underpinnings, not being on the Common Council, I might add. But <laughs> <laughs> Although I was known for doing a lot of editing, I was really good at finding the typos. I have to say I was good at that, <laughs> just like I'm good at it anywhere. But be that as it may, like, you know, when I was a publisher, 
um, founding public, uh, founder, a uh, co-founder, and then publisher of Kitchen Table Women of Color Press, the first press for women of color that reached a wide audience in the United States. Like that really just fit, you know, because it's not like I hated English; I loved it. So, yeah. being able to produce books and get the word out, you know, all of that worked for me. Um, um, I'm so sorry that uh, I went on longer than I had thought. I did not time this. And no, um, I, I hope, think it was... uh, Peter, I hope that you will save the questions in the chat if there's a way that you can do that, because I'm willing to look at those questions. And if I have anything to share uh, with people, I would be more than happy uh, to was... do that, because I know it's frustrating. Yeah, I was going to suggest have those that. kinds of dialogue. I was going to suggest that we grab those and then you know offer my apologies to anyone who didn't get a question answered live. Um, there's so much. There was great conversation in the chat happening while you were talking, and uh, don't feel bad about it at all. I think I want to see it. <laughs> yeah, so we'll make we'll grab really that and share it, it with you. Um, I'll give you one last question. Two two questions. One is my personal question, which is. Will you come back and do this again with us in some time, once some time has passed, to check back in with this group? Putting you on the spot. I can't believe you're asking me that. I can't believe you're asking me this on screen, Peter. <laughs> All right, you. I you can't. Can... I can't dissemble. I can't dissemble. You're not giving me a chance to to hem and haw. <laughs> I was trying to corner you. Um, um, yeah, yeah. You I'll, can, I'll say. You... I'll, I'll say it like this. I will take it very seriously your invitation. I appreciate um, it. And I think I told you when we talked, I never say yes to an invitation the first time someone's yes. asked. I never That's do. That's why I was getting it out of the way right now. So that when I come back in a couple of months and ask you <laughs> to come back to our group, um, you'll be willing to do it. The last one we'll give you, and then we'll, yeah, I want to be cognizant of everyone's time. Um, how does today, May 25th, 2021, you know, we, we talked about the, uh, you know, the somber anniversary that we're all acknowledging today and all this transpired going you know back decades uh but how does does today feel different to you in 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 versus other inflection points in this movement or i don't want to be deflating to the group but does it feel the same you feel something different this time well I, well i think that i mentioned some of the things that have happened as a result of the incredible outpouring of passionate organizing that happened right after we found out we didn't find out until the day after that george floyd had been killed we didn't find that out until the day after but immediately despite the fact that we were in the midst of a deadly pandemic with no vaccine people went out and spoke up in the most courageous ways that they possibly could. We had many, many, many actions here in our capital region, and people were particularly thrilled when there were actions in uh, the smaller towns around the capital region in areas that do not have a, have, uh, a uh, significant population of people of color. Um, it was just, um, heart up, it, it uplifted our hearts I, I feel um i have been contemplating writing an article that i well I, I better not say it on film because then good grief well i'll just say i've been contemplating writing an article um about how we have not experienced have not experienced a racial reckoning and my plan was to write like a list of all the indications of why that's not the case People refer to a racial reckoning that we have had, but I really don't think that has happened. And the major reason is uh, what I have tried to share with you, all of you today, which is that there has been virtually no delving into our examination of what are the roots of this problem. No one wants to talk about that because if you talk about it, and find out about it, you might feel implicated, and then you might also feel that you have to do something about it. So we can talk about um, police reforms and um, qualified immunity and um, retraining 
and licensing of police and all kinds of things. We can talk about shifting funding from the police to other kinds of interventions that are not backed up by weapons uh, to deal with uh, the inevitable crises and conflicts that people will experience in our lives. Um, all kinds of things can be talked about, but what I haven't heard at all in a public way is very often is people talking about root causes. People don't want to look at what purpose does it serve that our nation is so racially stratified and so uh, divided. People don't want to deal with that. They want to deal with the kind of cosmetic stuff as opposed to let's dig deep. I actually wrote an article, as you undoubtedly know, uh, about how to end white supremacy. And that was an article that was in the nation. And I really spelled it out. And <laughs> nobody's called me about that. Although there are some classrooms where the article is being used and their project for at least a, a semester, if not an entire year, was to develop their own plans for how to end, end white supremacy. Uh, it had a beginning, white supremacy did. It could have an end if people decided to do that. But first of all, it would have to be acknowledged and it would have to be named. I, I appreciate this so much. And uh, I thank you for your energy and your time into making this happen today. And I, you know, I know I speak for the hundreds who participated with us today that this was enlightening and, um, you know, I'm only one voice here, but certainly an acknowledgement that we just have so much further to go in this work. And um, but I appreciate this, uh, you know, unapologetic uh, approach to it. And uh, I learned a lot today, and I know others do too. So I, I want, on behalf of this group who was our audience today, it doesn't feel the same. And and hopefully next time we can be together in person to have these conversations. But I do uh, want to thank you for your time today and your energy and passion that you put into this, Barbara, and a big virtual round of applause for our guests today for all you've done, especially today. And I don't know if you can hear it. If you listen closely, there's a big thunderous applause <laughs> going for your time. Oh. And we will, <clears throat> we'll, leave it, we'll leave it there and we'll make sure we get you the chat, the Q&A. You can see the chat now is I've made the chat explode again with more uh, virtual applause. So. Um, we thank you so much, Barbara, and uh, to all the partners who helped to make this conversation happen today. We thank you. You can go to unitedwaygcr.org slash equity and find more information on this topic. You can find access to all of the op-eds that Barbara wrote through the course of the pandemic. Uh, those were uh, sent to participants ahead of time, but including her, her visionary plan to end white supremacy. Um, spend some time with that one and uh, you know that's it we will continue this conversation with our group coming going forward and uh, launching the next uh, iteration of our equity challenge in mid-june thanks so much barbara and uh, everybody have a great night and stay safe thank you and i want to say thank you and best of wishes for the work that you will continue to do thank you